Hello, this is Scott Pinnell in the safety department. Um, we are going to cover level two MRI safety training. This will meet the requirements for level two training for all MRI staff of shared medical services. Um, so that would be your technologist, the driver medical assistants, uh, and medical assistants. So all team members working in and around the MRI scanner. If you have questions related to this training, you can talk to your regional operations manager or contact me at the email address and phone number uh, listed on the bottom of the screen. The MRI topics we're going to talk about today are MRI magnetic fields, screening for ferromagnetic threats, screening for medical devices and implants, screening for NSF risks, patient positioning for preventing burns, other, cons other thermal considerations, auditory considerations, procedures in a code, emergency quench procedures, management of anxious or distressed patients, pregnant patients and team members, and then finally we'll finish up with SMS commitment to MRI safety. MRI turned 40 this year. Uh, it was invented by Raymond Damadian. He was the first to perform a full body scan of a human being in 1977 to diagnose cancer. It took him seven years to build the MRI scanner. He was too big to fit, so he used his thinner assistant. Uh, as you can see here in the photo, um, the machine was patented in 1974. Uh, in 1978, um, Damadian established a Fonar Corporation. The first commercial MRI was done in 1980. It's had 45 patents since then. Um, and the latest patents are full-sized MRI operating rooms and stand-up MRI. What started the push for MRI safety? In 2001, Michael Colombini, a six-year-old boy, was injured from an incident on a playground. The ER had a CT run which revealed an unknown asymptomatic brain tumor. The patient had surgery very shortly thereafter to remove the tumor. Prior to discharge, he was sent for a baseline MRI uh, for a reference in future monitoring. The patient was sedated prior to the exam um, and placed in the MR with a cannula to deliver oxygen. Before the exam began, the anesthesiologist observed a decline in O2 saturation and realized the oxygen from the wall wasn't coming out and flowing uh, despite his attempts to turn it up. The anesthesiologist called the technologist uh, who was to administer the exam to the door of the MR room. Uh, he instructed her to try to find and fix the source of the problem with the oxygen flow. Uh, that particular technologist wasn't familiar with the system um, and they, she sought her colleague. Um, both technologists left the MR room to go back to the MR equipment room. Um, the anesthesiologist cried out for help, though the technologist in the MR equipment room couldn't hear it. The anesthesiologist wasn't trained in MR safety, and the O2 system wasn't regulated. There was no alarm or no backup, and both technologists left the control room, uh, leaving the scan room um, access completely unsecured. A nurse who had accompanied an earlier patient to the MRI suite was returning to retrieve an item she forgot there. Uh, she heard the anesthesiologist cry for help. Uh, she handed him a portable cylinder that was near the door of the exam room. Um, it was ferrous, uh, ferromagnetic. The anesthesiologist turned to approach the patient and the tank was pulled from his grasp. The tank was pulled into the MR where it struck uh, Michael in the face and head uh, and killed him. The internal report from the hospital uh, president basically admitted uh, the accident was due uh, and caused from poorly trained staff, technical malfunctions and lapses in communication among workers. Since the Columbini accident that same year in 2001, the ACR uh, formed a blue ribbon panel of industry experts to address MR safety. The panel created the ACR guidance for safe MR practices. This document's evolved uh, many times over the years, uh, and the last publication was released on 2013. Healthcare agencies and safety organizations use the ACR guidance for standards in MRI safety uh, today. 
since the column Beanie accident and since the year 2000, they've been um, documenting and charting out adverse events compared to um, the utilization rate percentage increase. So what they did was in 2000, they did 15.8 million scans. In the year 2013, that jumped to 33 million point eight scans. Uh, the percentage rate, that would be a 114% increase. However, the accident rate was a 487% increase. Some of this can be um, related to reporting every incident, and that's what we want. Uh, we want every incident, every near miss reported, but some of it is just bad uh, MR safety practices. Uh, Dr. Canal made the uh, posted quote, show me another industry where more, the more we know about the risks and the more we know about prevention, the worse we do in terms of protecting people from known risks. Um, so again, uh, we have a long way to go as far as uh, MRI safety. We're going to talk about measuring the magnetic field in comparisons. Uh, if you look at the, the diagrams and the, the photos ahead uh, on the slide, you can see the Earth's field is 0.5 Gauss or 50 microtesla. MRI accelerator is uh, 0.1 Tesla to 10 Tesla. If you look at the bottom, 1 Tesla equals 10,000 Gauss. So really, uh, in all reality, a 1.5 Tesla magnet is almost 30,000 times uh, the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, and then that gives the permanent magnet um, readings below also. The next thing we're going to start talking about is static magnetic field effects and mechanical effects. Uh, the first of that is going to be translational forces. That's what we call the projectile effect. They can exist at any field strength uh, and they cause an object to accelerate or be pulled towards the center bore of the magnet. Um, you can see in the diagram here that the poles as they come around uh, and they both come together towards the center of the magnet, that's when you're going to get your most acceleration. Um, so it's the actual magnetic pull um, towards the center bore. With shielded magnets, you have to be careful uh, because the more the shielding, the less of a warning tug you're going to get further back out. So as you get to that point at the table with a 1.5 Tesla with our magnets, uh, with our scanners, you'll notice that it's going to pull all of a sudden. Uh, so there's a false sense of security with some heavily shielded magnets that I just want you to be aware of. Uh, and you gotta, you got to understand that um, you're not going to get as much of a warning pull or tug uh, with the more shielding that you have. Next thing we're going to talk about is rotational forces or torque motion. This is when the object, uh, the ferromagnetic object, tries to align with the magnetic field. So what it's going to do is, if you see in this uh, diagram or this photo that I show, the arrows actually come around uh, towards from each pole towards and try to align with the end of the magnet. So as you look at the straight off the end of that uh, magnet, it's, it's pretty much straight arrows uh, to a certain point. And then you can see the poles uh, coming around um, and arcing in towards the center of the magnet. And that's how the rotational torque effect works. Things try to align with the uh, magnetic pole at the end of that magnet. This is important uh, for certain objects like orbits uh, and things for implants because it's going to want to torque them. Next thing we're going to talk about is Lenz's Law, and it's a principle stating that an electric current induced by a source, such as a changing magnetic field, always creates a counterforce. And if you look at the diagram here, we're going to start in the top left corner. A changing magnetic field reinforced by an iron core induces an electromagnetic field, which drives an alternating current which is inducing its own changing magnetic field. Uh, so anything with an iron core um, will induce its own electromagnetic field. It's going to make an alternating current, change the magnetic field, and then that's going to oppose the original. That's why you can see aluminum being held on its edge. You see a, people using a pie plate, they'll hold it on its edge. It's because it's a, a producing its own opposing force and it'll hold itself at a certain point in the magnet. You can throw something, a spear or something at a magnet, uh, it'll stop right before the bore because of the opposing current that it's created. Um, again, that's called Lenz's Law. 
Next thing we're going to look at is the actual diagram of one of our mobile coaches for the fringe fields. This is a 1.5 Tesla uh, mobile coach. It shows the five Gauss line uh, is contained within the walls of the MRI scanner itself of the scan room, the magnet room. The one thing to remember here though is that it's a 360 degree uh, Gauss in a fringe field, uh, so you have to be careful uh, when people are working underneath it, it goes underneath and above it. Uh, so again, remember it's a 360 degree fringe field um, that we have with the mobile units. When people work on the coach, we've actually had to ramp the systems down uh, for welding and such because it'll pull it from the bottom and not create an arc. Uh, so basically what it's doing is it's drawing the arc away towards the magnet and they couldn't weld. So they actually have had to ramp uh, the magnets down in order to work. So it just shows that that 360 degree um, fringe field and the Gauss line uh, around the mobile trailers. The next thing you, diagram you're looking at here is right off the QA manual also and it's showing the fringe fields of a modular unit. We have a few modular units. Again, the five Gauss line is contained within the scan room itself. Uh, these are a little more oblong of a fringe field, uh, but it's pretty much the same concept. Um, so we just put this in here to show uh, comparison with the mobile and the modular. We're going to keep moving with screening for ferromagnetic threats. Uh, the process of screening, screening begins with the personnel assigned to control the MR environment. Uh, level 2 personnel, that is everyone watching this, um, you are level 2 certified. You've been more extensively trained um, and you basically know more broader aspects of the MR safety issues and, and you are the first and sometimes only um, security to that MRI magnet room. Uh, so you are level two personnel. Level one personnel would be more for ancillary staff such as emergency workers, hospital staff, janitorial staff, people that may work around the magnet um, but they don't need to have such uh, in-depth uh, knowledge of it. Everyone else would be considered non-MR personnel. Um, again, I want to stress that you guys completing level two are often our last and only line of defense when it comes to protecting the magnet room itself from ferromagnetic threats and uh, patient safety um, is huge and, and that's why we train you in level two uh, MRI safety. We're going to next start looking at labels. This is an MRI safe label. It means the device or implants completely non-magnetic, non-electrically conductive, and non-radio frequency reactive. Therefore, it's basically eliminating all the potential risks uh, during an MRI scanning. So again, uh, this is the MRI safe. You cannot go by color alone. Uh, green is not an indicator uh, on other things of MRI safe. Um, oxygen for DOT is a green label. It doesn't mean that it's MRI safe. So you gotta be careful, don't just go by color. Next thing we're going to look at is the MRI, MR conditional label. The device or implant may contain magnetic, electrically conductive, or radio frequency reactive components that are safe for operation in proximity to the MR, provided there's certain conditions uh, for safe operation and those conditions need to be met. Again, MR conditional is the yellow diamond and it means that there's conditions before you can allow um, the implant or device or whatever this is attached to into the MR magnet room. Third thing we're going to look at is the label of MR unsafe. That means anything with this uh, on it poses a clear and direct threat to persons and equipment within a magnet room and should not be allowed in a magnet room. A lot of the bigger items in your control room are going to have this MRI unsafe decal on them. Um, if you're ever in doubt also, you can use a magnet. I recommend the smaller sphere magnets um, if you're not sure of labeling. Uh, it's one more way to check to see if something's magnetic. Um, but again, this is the MR unsafe label. Next thing we're going to talk about is screening uh, zones. Um, so this is zone one and two. This is what the zone signage looks like. Zone one is free and accessible to the general public. Uh, they're really doesn't make sense that there's a zone one. It's just basically any free range for the general public. Zone two is kind of an intermediary uh, or intermediate 
zone. Um, it's where you would go pick a patient up. Uh, it has free control access to the general public. However, we are now preparing for someone to go into zones three and four at this area. Next, we're talking about zone three and four. Zone three is the control room uh, where we want to be screening patients. So access is restricted to people that are unscreened. Uh, this is where we also restrict access of ferromagnetic objects and equipment. Uh, this is where we're going through the screening process uh, and protective of zone four. Zone four is the magnet room itself. Um, the magnet room is always located, or zone four is always located within zone three. Um, and this is directed uh, directly observed by MRI level two personnel or you guys, uh, our team members, the techs and driver medical assistants. You always control access and have direct observation of zone four. Next, we're going to talk about screening forms. Um, all persons passing the five Gauss line must complete, sign, and date an MRI screening form each time. Uh, if any of the listed conditions on that form are present, um, the procedures indicated by the condition must be followed. A uh, reading radiologist will be consulted in any instance where there's not clear documentation of a conditional requirement. Minor patient screening forms, children, older children or teenagers should be questioned both in the presence of a guardian and separately and then the parent or guardian would sign that uh, minor patient screening form. Next thing we're looking at here is an MRI patient screening form. This is our form. I compared it with Dr. Shellick's form off of his MRI Safe website, and it's almost line by line identical. He does have some diagram photos and some questions on previous surgeries, but otherwise it's almost identical. We need to be careful when we're using site forms that we're covering the same questions and getting the same questions answered uh, for screening. If the site's forms are missing information and not asking the same questions, I recommend you let your ROM know and I recommend doing one of ours on top of it just to cover ourselves. We're going to be liable if something gets missed or we have an incident because we're using a form that doesn't cover all of this material. This is the MRI non-patient screening form. Uh, this is again used for anyone that goes into the MRI uh, magnet room that is not the patient themselves. So um, this would be any other nursing staff, hospital staff, or patient relatives that are there to help the patient through the exam. Again, anyone that hasn't done the patient screening form themselves uh, that is going into the MR magnet room needs to have this screening form, the MRI non-patient screening form completed. Next thing to talk about is the Garrett handheld metal detector. All patients and anyone accompanying a patient must be screened by an SMS team member before entering the scan room. Part of that screening process is being scanned with the Garrett handheld. Uh, it's an active metal detector with high sensitivity to all metals including ferrous, non-ferrous, and stainless steel. Um, it's a safety tool used to prevent metal objects from entering the scan room. That's what each patient should be told as you're scanning them. And there's a certain procedure and a way to use the Garrett handheld. It should be passed approximately one to two inches away from the body along the front, back, and both sides of the person being scanned. At no time should the device be used between the legs of the person being scanned. If the Garrett handheld uh, detector alarms, the patient should be asked if there's any metallic objects on them or if they can recall of any medical procedures or implants uh, where metal metallic objects could have been used. Um, SMS team members should follow SMS procedures already in place regarding implants or metallic medical devices found using the Garrett handheld. Next thing we're going to talk about is metallic objects in the magnet itself, any metallic objects that are inadvertently pulled into the magnet are to be reported using a non-vehicle incident report form. Um, so this also applies to patients. If there was a patient uh, that were injured in such an event, we'd get the patient information uh, from that form. Uh, we also use this to uh, record near misses of things being pulled into the magnet. Next we're talking about eyes, patients who have a history of trauma, by a potential ferromagnetic foreign body by which they have required medical attention are required to have orbit films obtained prior to or a prior contiguous cut CT. 
These must be reviewed according to the facility policy to determine the course of action. If the films are negative for metal, the exam will proceed. When metal is detected, an alternate modality must be used. Other areas of the body, the location and longevity of the metallic object in a body must be assessed. The radiologist must then be consulted to determine if the imaging procedure will be safe. Anyone who, any patient that has an occupation involving metal, the SMS team members will consult a radiologist when the patient's occupation involves metal, uh, which may cause safety concerns for the MRI. Metallic prisoner restraining devices, patients wearing metallic prisoner restraining devices, or radio uh, frequency ID tracking bracelets must be accompanied by appropriate authorities to remove the device prior to the MRI study. Uh, and they will be, those same authorities will be responsible for its replacement upon completion of the study. Skin staples or metal sutures. The decision whether to scan a patient's skin staples or superficial metal sutures is determined by the reading radiologist or ordering physician. Any skin staples or metal sutures present in the patient undergoing an MR scan must be non-ferromagnetic and not in the area of the coil being used to scan. That part of the body of interest. If the staples or sutures are located in that area being scanned uh, near the coil, um, the following procedures are recommended. The patients to be warned of the possibility of warming uh, and they will be instructed to immediately activate the patient alert system. If at all possible, a cold compress or ice pack is also placed on the staples or sutures to help decrease the possibility of thermal injury or burn occurring. Drug delivery patches or pads. Some drug delivery patches and pads have metallic foil backing that if on or near the body part being scanned could cause thermal injury and burns. Removal of or repositioning could result in altering a patient's dose and shouldn't be attempted without approval of the patient's prescribing physician. However, foil-backed medication patches or drug patches that contain contraindicative silver components cannot remain on the patient for an MRI exam, regardless of the patch is in the area being imaged. In the event removal of the patch or pad is approved by a physician, uh, replacement or repositioning should be done as directed by this physician. If the patch or pad is to be discarded, it's to be given to the patient and to be taken for disposal as directed by the physician. There is also medication patches and pads that contain silver components that will cause burning during the scan and the aforementioned procedures should be taken. If the medication patch does not appear to have a metallic component, which means it's clear, it's not necessary to remove the patch during an MR procedure. Piercings and jewelry to avoid possible burns from unknown metal content. All piercings and jewelry must be removed prior to scanning, regardless of the body part being scanned, unless the site has specific written policy. In the case of microdermal piercings, um, these are permanent body piercings, dermal anchors, uh, implants, uh, microdermal implants. A radiologist should be consulted. There are two types of metal used, titanium, which is MR safe, and rhodium, uh, which is not MR safe. The radiologist will have the final approval on whether to proceed or cancel uh, due to safety concerns. Garments, you got to be careful for all garments, including socks and underwear that may contain metallic fibers, as they do have a possibility of burning a patient. Um, only items made of cotton, silk, nylon, or wool should be worn uh, while being scanned. Bras with metal clips or clasps or underwire uh, may be required to be removed. Here are some images of some metallic fiber in clothing. Uh, this is the antimicrobial clothing, um, the anti-moisture wicking uh, clothing. You got to be careful for that. Uh, it will cause a burn as indicated here uh, in the, the lower photo with blisters already forming. Um, so again, some patients may not even know they're wearing this, but if it's athletic material, you may want to check labeling before you just leave it on the patient. Talking about patient wheelchairs, ferromagnetic wheelchairs are not allowed in the magnet room. Each imaging system is equipped with an MRI compatible walker. These again are just aids. Uh, and they're made for the last couple steps. So bring the patient's wheelchair up, you can bring it into the control room and then have it right at the scan room door. And then the last few steps, they can use the MRI conditional walker. Um, it should be clean and disinfected after each use. 
Next, we're looking at gait belts. If you have a patient you've already done the assessment on, they're seated in a wheelchair uh, or they need help, uh, you're going to want a gait belt. So every coach has a 60-inch plastic gait belt and you wrap that around the patient, secure it snug, and then you hold them up. It's just an extra tool to hold the patient up. Uh, and it also will save your back and injury possibly uh, with getting help from another person. You can put one on each side and help them to a standing position to get them to the table. Again, it's just a tool to help you stay safe while you're lifting a heavier patient and a patient that can't help much lift themselves. We're going to move the topic to screening for devices and implants. Uh, we're going to talk about implant classification. All implants are classified as MR safe, MRI unsafe, and MR conditional. Safe implants are approved to be scanned no matter what. Unsafe implants are not to be scanned no matter what. And conditional implants have specific conditions that must be evaluated uh, to before and make sure they can be met uh, before a patient can safely be scanned with that implant. Any surgical implants or materials or devices uh, should be referenced using the reference manual for MR safety or the list. The list is the web page of Dr. Shellock. It should be on the icon on most desktops in the scanners. If a surgically implanted device has a power source associated with proper operation, it's unlikely the patient will be able to have an MRI unless there's written documentation that proves conditional requirements. Uh, such uh, device is safe in a magnetic field. Uh, the documentation is often obtained from the manufacturer and that needs to be done and obtained before the patient can be scanned. For questions concerning conditional requirements um, or safety of surgical implants, contact the imaging system personnel or your regional operations manager. Here's a simple chart to help you for labeling of implants and devices. First you identify the device and follow it down, you determine the labeling. If it's MRI conditional, what are the conditions? Can you provide them? Uh, and is it safe to go forward and scan? If it's an MR unsafe label, you obviously have to stop and you can't scan that patient. Here is the MRISafety.com screenshot. This should be found on the icon of your MR um, laptop or desktop. Um, what it is is the Shellac reference uh, book in e uh, electronic form. And if nothing else, this can be used to find the manufacturer and then the conditional status uh, of that device. Um, if you can't get enough information from here, you'll at least get the information for the manufacturer so you can contact them and get information to the radiologist before continuing with a scan. Next, we're going to talk about further implants, a pacemaker. In general, patients with a pacemaker should not be scanned. Patients with a pacemaker can only be scanned with prior written consent from the cardiologist, radiologist, and approval from the manufacturer. Additionally, the appropriate personnel must be on site at the time of scan. They are making some pacemakers where you don't need the additional personnel. You can just verify the newer models uh, and get the conditions met and then get the approval from the radiologist. Aneurysm clips, an MRI exam will not be performed on a patient identified to have an intracranial aneurysm clip until there's written documentation signed by a licensed physician that identifies that clip in that patient uh, to be MRI safe or a statement from the manufacturer uh, authorizing its safety. Previous MR studies with an aneurysm clip in place should not be considered a determination that that clip is safe to image. Variations in static magnetic field strengths, orientation of the clip to the magnetic field, and the rate of movement through the magnetic field are uncontrollable and not reproducible variables that can be encountered. Here's a side-by-side -side photo to um, compare intercranial aneurysm clips uh, in an MR. The left, you can see the MRI conditional and then the right is the MRI unsafe, and you can obviously see on the right the artifact involved uh, with that scan. Neurostimulators, external neuro neurostimulator control units and patches must be removed prior to entering the magnet room. Internal neurostimulators have a power source associated with proper operation as well as wires leading to the source. Therefore, it's really unlikely a patient would be able to have an MRI. Even if there's written documentation that proves conditional requirements, safety of device, 
when introduced to a magnetic field, an MRI reading radiologist will be consulted before the scan can be performed. Coicular implants. Coicular implants are electronically activated devices in general. All individuals with coicular implants should be prevented from entering the MRI environment. They do make brand new models now that do have some of the electronic uh, in the, uh, parts of it that are removable. Um, but as general a rule, you should not uh, put someone with coicular implants into uh, MRI magnet scanner. Coils, filters, and stents. All coils, filters, and stents must be identified by the brand and model and verified for compatibility. Again, you're going to use the reference manual um, or the uh, MRI safety uh, website to verify. Prior stent imaging, please look for the manufacturer uh, for conditional requirements. If there is any question concerning conditional requirements of the stent, the reading radiologist is to be contacted. Coronary artery stents only. All efforts should be made to obtain the actual brand and model of the stent. In the event that no information is obtainable, the reading radiologist is to be consulted for approval to follow the following guidelines. Following guidelines apply using MRI patients with coronary artery stents. Patients with all commercially available coronary artery stents, including drug eluting and non drug eluting or bare metal variations, can be scanned in a 1.5 or 3 Tesla, regardless of the value of the spatial gradient magnetic field. Patients with all commercially available coronary artery stents can undergo an MRI immediately after placement of these stents. The MRI examination must be performed using the following parameters, a 1.5 Tesla or 3 Tesla only. Whole body average specific absorption rate or SAR of 2 watts per kilogram operating in normal operating mode for the MR system. Ma maximum imaging time is 15 minutes per pulse sequence. Any deviation from the above MRI conditions requires prior approval by the radiologist or supervising physician. Next we're going to talk about gadolinium contrast. It's basically a complex uh, arrangement of atoms held together by chemical bonds. The chemical bonds are made between a gadolinium ion and a carrier molecule called a chelating agent. Um, gadolinium itself is a dense metal, a natural dense metal. However, it's highly toxic to the body. Um, to the patient. So what they use is the chelating agent to intertwine and to kind of wrap around like a claw the gadolinium. Um, and we still get the um, imaging effects of the slowing of the molecular tumbling. Um, that's what the actual gadolinium does. It slows the tumbling. Uh, but yet it's not toxic because of the chelating agent that's attached to it. Depending um, on the scan, there is some gadolinium, residual gadolinium, that's left in the body and it's absorbed into some tissues, uh, including brain and, and certain organs. Only FDA approved MRI contrast, which is supplied by the host facilities, should be used for our studies. All contrast should be stored at the host facility. The radiologist or ordering physician shall determine if the patient requires contrast and then the amount. All MRI contrast used is considered high alert medication and should be treated as such. Next we're going to talk about nephrogenic systemic fibrosis or NSF also known as nephrogenic fibrosing dermopathy or NFD. It's a disease of fibrosis in the skin and internal organisms um, and basically it is linked to gadolinium exposure used in imaging of patients who already have some type of renal insufficiency. Here you're going to see some uh, major criterium or joint um, issues from NSF. Uh, what you're looking at is um, some joint swelling. Um, it looks like it starts as the tissue base and skin layer and then it goes into the joint itself. Uh, so you can see some comparison of swelling joints uh, and some skin um, looks like a rash, but it's actually a deterioration of the skin and the tissue underneath, and it's all caused by NSF. Next set of photos show uh, placking in the eyes, and you can see the placking around the eyeballs. It kind of turns uh, just, just outside of the iris. It's the yellow placking on the actual uh, white part of the eye itself. Um, again, this is a known um, symptom of someone with NSF. 
This last slide shows that NSF and NS NFD, it shows a timeline and that we've actually pretty much got cases disappeared once we figured out what was going on. In 1997, they found a skin disease and it was uh, noted among dialysis patients. In 2003, they realized that it was just more than a skin disease and affected tissues of the heart, liver, lung, and muscle. And in 2006, they connected it to GAD uh, use um, and people with renal deficiencies. And in 2007, they did a black box warning, and by 2012, nearly all cases were gone. Renal disease or dialysis patient for any patients that's scheduled for an MRI that is undergoing dialysis and or has renal disease, the interpreting radiologist or ordering physician for the facility will determine if they'll receive an IV contrast and the dose that's to be injected. Creatin or GFR rate, guidelines provided by the radiology group or site should be followed for determination of safety. Renal function should be checked. The largest number of NSF cases are on the scan, Optimark and Magnavist. And then there's been no known cases of NSF linked with MultiHance itself. We're gonna move on next to thermal considerations. All electronically conductive materials are to be removed from the patient prior to entering the magnet bore. All coils or cables that enter the magnet are to be visually inspected by an SMS team member before entry into the bore. Care should be taken to ensure that all coils or cables don't form on any type of loop. And then to make sure there's insulation placed between the patient and any electrically conductive materials. Patients are to be protected from any skin contact. Uh, with the inner bore of the magnet as well as with the coil being used. Pads are provided by the manufacturer and must be used for this purpose. Sheets or blankets aren't a substitute for padding. If the patient doesn't fit in a scanner while using minimal padding, a quarter to a half inch, the patient shouldn't be scanned. The reason is, is we heat the patient up and the sweat actually uh, turns the sheet or blanket wet and then it doesn't do its insulating. Patients should be instructed not to cross their arms or legs while in the magnet to avoid tissue from forming a conductive loop. Here we're going to look at some images of some burns from a MR scanner. The first top left corner is an RF burn from an electrode. Going across the uh, top right corner, the right portion of the slide, that is an EKG or ECG lead burn. You can see both of them where the electrode was, where the wires came down for the leads. And then the last one on the bottom left corner is a tattoo. The newer the tattoo uh, is, the more likely it is to burn. And then the biggest thing to remember is most burns aren't felt at the time of the scan because the pain receptors are damaged first, so they don't even feel it until it's too late. We had a case of this earlier this year where a patient um, went to a doctor two weeks after an MRI scan with us. During the time of scan, she only reported a small reddish area and the feeling of heat, but within two weeks she already had blisters and that doctor associated that to burning in the MRI scanner. So we got to be careful with this. The next thing we're going to talk about is specific absorption rate or SAR. It's the measure of rate at which energy is absorbed by the human body when exposed to a radio frequency or RF magnetic field. SAR is expressed in units of watts per kilogram of patient tissue mass or, or watts by kilogram. FDA SAR limits whole body is 4 watts per kilogram, 15 minute exposure. Head is 3 watts per kilogram, 10 minute exposure. Head or torso is 8 watts per kilogram, 5 minute exposure, and then the extremities are 12 watts per kilogram to a 5 minute exposure. The international SAR limits uh, don't go above a normal operating mode, and most of our scanners you can't do that anyway, so we don't really have to concern ourselves with the upper international SAR limits. Now, one of the last things we're going to talk about regarding um, energy absorbed by the patient. It's called a specific energy dose or SED. This is a total accumulated amount of energy that goes gets deposited in the body. So basically it's your SAR times time and that's all that is. Think about it as a like a bathtub getting filled. So as you enter the SAR times time, the total amount is called your specific energy dose or your total. Next, we're going to talk about auditory considerations. An MRI makes noise as the electrical currents running through the gradient coil. 
When the current switched on, there's an outward force and the coil causes a vibration. Uh, when it's switched on, the coil goes from zero to large in milliseconds, causing the coil to expand, span, which makes a loud click. And when we're imaging, we're basically doing the on and off rapidly, which results in a rapid fire clicking noise. All persons present in the magnet room during scanning are required to use hearing protection. SMS provides that protection. For patients, we usually use the um, headphones with music. Um, otherwise, uh, we also have earplugs if you're using a head coil or, or we can't use the um, headphones. Let's start talking about codes. Cardiac respiratory arrest, all team members must know where the instructions for calling a code are located. Uh, this was really evident that you guys have been doing this during our joint inspection, our recent joint inspection. Uh, so you wanna have the uh, emergency contact book out at every site. And it's vital to get the patient out of the magnet room and not allow responding staff into the magnet room. Contrast reaction, any contrast reaction that's reported uh, should be reported to the facility and the SMS admin office. And then we need a medical incident form as soon as possible following that incident, the contrast reaction. Uh, I know they're also now done on the SMS portal. All reactions should also be recorded to the vendor itself on a supplied uh, vendor form by email or by uh, telephone, whatever that specific vendor wants. Next, we're gonna talk about a quench. Superconducting magnet uh, is made from coils of superconducting wire. They must be cooled to cryogenic temperatures during operation. Uh, it's in a superconducting state that they conduct the higher electric currents, uh, and it's higher than ordinary wire. So that's how we get the intense magnetic fields. Cryogen pumps circulate the liquid helium to keep the temperatures at a cryogenic state. If the system fails, the cryogenic system fails or is abruptly stopped, a chain reaction begins. As the temperature increases, so does the resistance. As the resistance builds, so does the temperature and so on. The current resistance leads to a very hot wire already submerged in liquid helium. The liquid helium then begins to boil off and it starts to build pressure. How much pressure do they have during a quench? Uh, one unit of liquid helium is equal to 760 units of gas during boil off. Uh, that's a lot of pressure. Potential health risks associated with the quench, asphyxiation. Helium itself isn't toxic, however, it displaces oxygen if the room isn't ventilated. There are two vents to the scan room of our MRI coaches. If the main exhaust vent or, uh, or secondary exhaust vent are clogged, the gases can fill the scan room. If venting is clogged, the room can pressurize. If the door won't open, the window will need to be broken. Uh, frostbite or burn don't stand in the direct path of a gaseous helium. Again, uh, we have to tell you this, but I've been told that with both vents, um, it's almost impossible for the actual room to be uh, pressurized unless one or both of the vents are plugged. And that's a good idea to then walk around uh, during pre-trip, post-trip to just make sure those aren't plugged. In the event of a quench, um, either by the alarm or foggy appearance in the magnet room, immediately open the door to the magnet room. If the door to the magnet room will not open due to the magnet room being pressurized, the viewing window must be broken to relieve that pressure. So again, if the vents are clog clogged, you're not going to get that door open without smashing the viewing window. You're going to enter the magnet room through the door. Keep low to the floor while communicating with the patient. Grasp the manual table release and remove the patient from the bore of the magnet. Assist the patient from the table out of the, out to, of the magnet room, keeping as low as possible. Assist the patient from the imaging system to the emergency room. All SMS team members are to evacuate the imaging system and restrict access to the system until it can be firm the magnetic field has been successfully dissipated. You're going to contact service personnel immediately, and you're going to communicate the situation to the facility personnel, your ROM, and the SMS admin office as soon as possible. We're going to complete a non-vehicle incident report with regard to the patient, so we get the patient contact information there. A report of SMS team member injury form must be completed uh, to all the team members that entered the room, and then a non-vehicle incident report form must be completed in regards to the equipment itself. If an incident occurs uh, that involves injury or serious injury or entrapment, uh, the magnet may have to be intentionally quenched using the emergency stop button. 
Uh, when that emergency stop button is depressed, the magnet will quench. There's no way to bring it back. All steps for the magnet quench are then followed that we just previously went through. Um, bringing the system back up after a quench or emergency stops very expensive will more than likely include downtime, uh, so they should only be pushed as a last resort. Emotional distress. Patients' distress can continue, contribute to adverse outcomes for MR procedure. These adverse outcomes include unintentional exacerbation of patient distress, uh, compromise in quality, and thus uh, diagnostic aspects of the imaging study, and decreased efficiency of the MRI fa facility due to delayed, uh, prematurely terminated, or canceled studies. Uh, patient compliance during an MR procedure, such as the ability to rain, remain in the MR system and to hold still long enough to complete the study. So what do we do to help uh, limit the emotional distress on patients? You want to prepare and educate the patient concerning specific aspects of, aspects of the MR procedure. Um, the noise, the gradient noise, the intercom system, constant presence of you, the tech, or the driver, medical assistant. You can allow uh, appropriately screened relative or friend to remain with the patient. You can maintain verbal and visual or physical contact with the patient during the MR procedure. Use an appropriate uh, headphone stereo system to provide music to the patient. Use mirrors or prism glasses to redirect the patient's line of sight. Uh, some people use a blindfold or uh, washcloth. Uh, to put over the patient's eyes so they're not aware of the surrounding. Use lights inside the MR system. Use a fan inside the MR system. You can use relaxation techniques such as controlled breathing or mental imagery. And then uh, we can use sedation. And the next slide will cover the steps of sedation. The following are guidelines to be referenced when it's determined a patient needs sedation. If it's an outpatient, uh, it must be determined that the patient has someone to transport them home after the exam. If arrangements aren't made, the scan must be rescheduled. Radiology will be consulted. The radiologist or physician on call will order the medication. The appropriate healthcare facility personnel will administer the drug. We do not. The patient will be monitored prior to healthcare per healthcare facility policy. The patient will be monitored with MR-compatible pulse oximeter when available. Site-specific policies should be followed when applicable and available. And then the patient must be handed off to the host facility staff upon completion of the exam. Pregnant patients and team members. The MRI interpreting radiologist must be consulted if a patient scheduled for an MRI exam is pregnant or suspects the possibility of being pregnant. Although there are known, known side effects of MR, which does not use ionizing radiation, the long-term effects of MRI cannot be fully evaluated, and the FDA has not formally approved MRI for pregnant women or fetus. The final medical decision rests on the referring physician and the interpreting radiologist. The use of gadolinium contrast agent for a pregnant patient should be determined by the MR interpreting radiologist and the patient's physician after consulting the product insert for manufacturer recommendations. Breastfeeding, because a very small percentage of gadolinium-based contrast medium that is excreted into the breast milk and absorbed by the infant's stomach, we believe the available data suggests that it's safe for the mother to and the infant to continue breastfeeding after receiving such an agent. Ultimately, an informed decision to the temporarily stop breastfeeding should be left up to the mother. If the mother remains concerned about any potential ill effects to the infant, she may abstain from breastfeeding um, from the time of contrast administration for a period of 12 to 24 hours. There is no documented value to stop breastfeeding beyond 24 hours. The mother should be told to express and discard breast milk from both breasts after contrast administration until breastfeeding resumes. In anticipation of this, she may wish to use a breast pump to obtain milk uh, before the uh, contrast enhanced study. Um, pregnant team members, pregnant technologists and healthcare workers are allowed to perform MRI procedures, enter the MR scan room and attend the patient during pregnancy regardless of the trimester. Importantly, technologists and healthcare workers should not remain in the MR system room 
or magnet room uh, during the actual operation of the scan. These recommendations are not based on indications of adverse effects, but rather from a conservative point of view, and the feeling that there are insufficient data pertaining to the effects of the electromagnetic fields uh, of the MRS system, system to support or allow unnecessary exposures. This is going to conclude the MRI Level 2 safety training. Again, we do have uh, an SMS commitment to MR safety. Uh, SMS is committed to safety of its team members and patients. If you have questions or concerns regarding the information shared in this training, please contact your ROM or SMS safety. If you have input to help make MRI safety better, please contact your ROM or SMS safety. Again, I know we just threw a lot of information at you, um, and I hope it helped. Uh, if you have questions or need uh, to make additional comments, just let us know. I uh, really appreciate your time and attention, and we just thank you uh, for everything you guys do in the field. Uh, it, it means a lot to SMS and the patients that we serve.